Hi right, guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous, and I am talking about an over-the-top beautiful Sunday afternoon in the collapse of everything here in paradise at Bugs in a Jar Farm on this Sunday, September 8, 2024. And so I have spent all day on this gorgeous day you know, just working out in the yard and and planning all of my future visions for the expanding gardens around here and and where to move this berry bush and this hydrangea and busting my ass for hours on end for for something that that I you know there will be no return on this investment minimally for eight months. And I could very well be dead. And I'm thinking, what in the hell are you out here doing this for, dude? What the hell is a doomer who knows how fucked we are uh, out here? I'm just out here, uh, you know, planting my flowers uh, as my antidote to, uh, to to the hell coming down. So I, so I finish that and I come over here. Open up medium.com and, 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 and just start reading uh, j just the same shit uh, day in, day out, uh, that, that we're completely fucked. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, if they're honest, uh, the few that are honest, and, and then you have the vast majority of the apocalyptimists spelling out the problem and, and, and then going off into la-la land. And I'm reading article after article and not learning one, one single thing. One, one single thing. It's everything that I read in here uh, I already know. And I'm saying, that, what the hell are you doing reading this stuff? <coughs> and then going out there on YouTube and, and sharing uh, this information... In, in this little echo chamber of the Doomosphere, there's not one person listening to this uh, who, who does not already know uh, every single thing that, that, that I'm getting ready to read here. Uh, there is not w one person on medium.com uh, down there in the little Doomosphere in that little corner, that tiny little corner of medium.com. Uh, who doesn't understand this, and, and every day we line up uh, like pigs at the trough, like moths at the flame, and, and, and just sit here and, 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 and just listen to it all again, and, and go about our business, and, and then get up. And, and, and Anyway, so that's what I'm doing uh, this afternoon. And, and you think, you know, as long as I've been on here, that, that surely I would have heard of every doomer on medium.com and and then uh, here uh, is this new fellow named Graham Townsend. Graham Townsend uh, never heard of this guy. Uh, apparently he's been writing a uh, doomer porn uh, for medium.com uh, for, for the entire time I, I've been subscribed on here Never heard of this guy. Uh, he has a whopping 95 followers. He says he has a background in chemical physics. That is all I know about this man is he has a background in chemical physics. Uh, I'm going down his list of, uh, uh, of articles and uh, he, he said, okay, we're going to listen to the perspective uh, of some dude. He looks like he's about my age or a few years older with a background in chemical physics, whatever the hell that means. And we're going to look at the article uh, from July 3rd called Planetary Overshoot and the Threat of fascism that this is this book length article that uh, Graham has written with all of these individual chapters and uh, 
Yes. And uh, so I'm going to start about a third of the way down, keep track of the time. Uh, when I hit 30 minutes or when my camera battery collapses, I guess I'll wrap it up. I'll put the link on here for you guys from Medium. But uh, if, if you're, you know, if you've been down in the Doomosphere, uh, particularly listening to this channel uh, for more, uh, you know, than about three weeks, uh, there, there, there's nothing you're going to learn here. Uh, so you might as well, uh, I, I, I don't know, go watch Dave Chappelle's Dreamer uh, special on Netflix, a much better use of your time. <clears throat> But anyway, we're going to scroll through. We're going to doom scroll through this uh, book length essay. And we're going to pick up with the chapter A Dose of Reality Post Prosperity. Take it away. Nothing of any value can be created or manufactured without the use of energy. It follows that the global economy is based not on finance, but on energy and the resources energy unlocks. Nobody creates wealth. We just sequester natural resources for our use during our lifetimes. The Industrial Revolution culminating in the post-World War II prosperity boom was an energy revolution. It relied on the availability and energy density of fossil fuels. Barring the unlikely advent of safe, commercially viable nuclear fusion or supernatural intervention, that boom is now over. Why? Number one, diminishing EROI, pop quiz, EROI, energy return on investment. We have used up the cheapest source of fossil fuels. Number two, we have already exploited the most accessible sources of key minerals, including vital fertilizers such as phosphate. Number three, the rising cost of climate change. The impact already locked in is predicted to shrink the global economy by around 19% by 2050. If we don't shift rapidly to a low-carbon economy, that damage will accelerate. Number four, our flouting of other planetary boundaries includes issues such as overfishing, desertification, urban sprawl on the valuable arable land, and water shortages. These issues, and I'm sure he could have gone on, you know, to, uh, to 100, he stopped after four. These issues are complex, interlinked, and exacerbated by population growth. Together, they underscore the reality that the global economy depends on a thriving biosphere. No more magical thinking, please. Yeah, right. Politicians are supposed to plan for the future. It's what we pay them for. In reality, they make a living by selling optimism. When climate and related issues do come up, do they ever come up? Politicians usually reassure us with promises of a smooth transition to a green economy based around investment in wind and solar energy, battery storage, and related, quote, sustainable technologies. All of those technologies and more will certainly be needed, but 
free market policies will not deliver that transition, certainly not in the short time we have available. More fundamentally, Earth lacks the resources, specifically the strategic minerals needed to maintain our lifestyle in a sustainable future economy. Yes, then he quotes, uh, he has over 50 footnotes. So quoting uh, whatever footnote 36 is sourced from, quote, it's not only China that will need to mine and process minerals needed for the green economy. The UN says that if the world is to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, which of course, even if there was such a thing as that, it ain't going to happen. Their use, you know, these minerals, must increase six-fold by 2040. That is clearly not going to happen. <clears throat> Conventional economists, bankers, politicians, and political pundits squander their time and intellectual ability, I think he should have put that in quotes, minutely analyzing productivity, GDP, debt-to-asset ratios, investor confidence, trade agreements, policy settings, and the actions of central banks. They rarely mention that the underlying drivers of the global, they rarely mention the underlying drivers of the global economy, access to energy and the physical resources energy unlocks. They remind me irresistibly of the 17th century Archbishop Usher who used his considerable intellect to calculate from biblical sources that the world began at 6 p.m. on October 22nd, 4004 B.C. My point, no analysis is valid unless it starts from valid science-based premises. All their number crunching and market analysis is simply barking up the wrong tree in the wrong forest on the wrong continent. There are comically irresistible parallels here with phlogiston theory, like we're supposed to know what the hell phlogiston theory in 18th century protochemistry or the Earth-centric universe of Ptolemy's cosmology. Both had some limited predictive power, but were increasingly inadequate when more information became available. Finally, they were seen to be ludicrous. And uh, I would certainly add most of this shit you read on the business page uh, today. We have grown up believing that wealth is a product of hard work, that entrepreneurs are the lifeblood of the economy, and that a rising tide floats all boats. But we live on a finite planet, and the economic tide is no longer rising, but falling. No human has the right to sequester and consume more than their share of finite resources. There is nothing wrong with the entrepreneurial spirit, but we need to stop seeing rich listers as captains of industry, heroes, or role models. Their sequestration of Earth's finite resources is parasitic and anti-life. 
they care nothing for you or I. And recent history shows that their mantra, that trickle down, we'll see the rest of us right, is a self-serving fiction. If we want a viable future climate, we need to get our annual per capita greenhouse gas footprint below around 2.3 tons of CO2 equivalent. In developed nations, it's currently several times higher than that with the richest 1% fouling the atmosphere faster than the poorest 66% of the world's population. The task of government now must be to maximize citizens' well-being within realistic planetary boundaries. Ain't gonna happen. A rational response would involve honest consultation via citizens' assemblies and based on science literacy. Yes, ain't gonna happen. This is starting to sound a little bit like Guy McPherson's little fantasy that lasted about six weeks that we're going to uh, rely on subcommittees of subcommittees of subcommittees of uh, human intelligence to turn the freight train around. Uh, anyway, what we grandly call the global economy is merely a self-serving name for the ecological niche of a primate with the cheek to call itself Homo sapiens. The laws of physics care nothing for human aspirations, theories, or delusions. So, while business cyclically will no doubt continue, the trend is downhill from here even if we do manage to shift away from fossil fuels, which of course ain't going to happen, but uh, if, if we shift from fossil fuels into the bright green lies, it's out of the frying pan into the fire. Anyway, uh, okay, where are we? 17 minutes. Okay, next chapter, please. Post-prosperity inflation, declining services, and the cost of climate disruption. <coughs> We're going to hear some predictions. <clears throat> Over the next two to three decades, the next two to three decades, I, I guess he's including the 2020s in that decade, the impact of climate breakdown will likely hit the hardest in tropical Africa, Central and South America, the Middle East, and much of Asia. As just one example, the impact of global heating on Himalayan glaciers is already threatening water supplies and farming viability for hundreds of millions of people. China also is not immune. Its heartlands are extremely vulnerable to climatic extremes. Those of us lucky enough to live in temperate regions, you know, such as the Finger Lakes of New York, may be somewhat cushioned for a while, but we will still experience the impact of adverse weather events and sea level rise on insurance costs, farm incomes, and infrastructure repairs, along with supply chain issues and accelerating inflation, our trading partners in more vulnerable regions, including China, will find themselves increasingly unable or 
unwilling to buy our exports or support our tourism industries. I don't know about that last one. Have you ever heard of disaster tourism? Okay, next chapter. Economic uncertainty, citizen resentment, and the blame game. Constructing a viable future economy means accepting the limits to growth. Like it or not, like it or not we are about to get poorer. Shifting to a low carbon economy is going to cost us, but failure will cost a lot more. We can either accept that reality and cooperate for our kids' sake, or we can fight over it. When governments do show the rare courage needed to implement policies aimed at reducing environmental harm, there is often a backlash. On the whole, however, rather than facing up to the harsh reality of planetary boundaries, politicians are still peddling the Pied Piper fantasy of endless GDP growth leading to nirvana, the glossy magazine lifestyle for us all. Their reassurance and delusions are starting to sound hollow. In real terms, the global economy is shrinking. Most people are already experiencing increasingly unaffordable housing, food, and fuel costs. Rapidly rising insurance premiums. My flood insurance here at a uh, at a uh, Bugs in a Jar farm went up about 30 percent this year. Uh, rapidly rising insurance premiums, growing student debt, declining access to health services, longer wait times in hospital emergency departments, and sharp rises in council taxes, which means uh, local taxes here in the U.S. Government austerity measures are already increasing unemployment and causing infrastructure to fail more frequently. The rise in extreme weather will, of course, accelerate infrastructure damage. I think the New York Times uh, had a big article, I think it was the New York Times, uh, just recently about uh, climate change uh, effects on bridges all the way and uh, some study they were quoting that 25 percent of the bridges in, in this country uh, are scheduled to collapse between now and 2050. Anyway, back to the story. Inevitably, the gap between myth and reality is causing rising resentment and fueling a tendency to lash out at scapegoats, the dull bludgers, the bottom feeders, solo parents, tax evaders, <clears throat> a bloated civil service, inefficient local government, those greedy bankers, profiteering corporations, government subsidies, ethnic minorities, them immigrants taking our jobs, and more. At best, these campaigns are simplistic. More often, they are irrational and based on prejudice and dogma rather than the evidence. Almost always, they miss the central underlying factor. We are past peak prosperity. Come election time, disgruntled voters 
often focused their discontent on the incumbent government. Increasingly, it seems that governments get voted out rather than voted in. Well, we're in a little bit of a weird place in this country. Uh, not only does this blame game, you, you know, this false divide between political parties fail to address the central problem, it encourages distrust, polarization, societal division, and political volatility. Adding to our disquiet is a falling liver, living standards is migration. As the climate crisis bites ever deeper, the current tide of economic migrants into the USA and Europe will soon become an unstoppable flood, further raising resentment and ethnic tensions. Have I hit 30 minutes yet? Okay, we're going to read one more chapter. We're going to finish up with the chapter Retreat from Rationality. History suggests that periods of uncertainty and anxiety provide a rich spawning ground for rumor, distrust, scapegoating, and conspiratorial thinking. In our post-prosperity world, unease, anxiety, and concern for the future are certainly on the increase. The challenge of living within planetary boundaries demands unprecedented global co cooperation, compassion, science literacy, critical thinking, and long-term planning. Instead, we are witnessing rationality in retreat. Carl Sagan's 1995 book, The Demon Haunted World, warned of a future where people are increasingly tempted to fall for conspiracy theories and lose the ability to think critically. So they are unable or unwilling to distinguish between information and disinformation. We seem to have reached that point. Social media, of course, provides fertile soil for the growth of misinformation, the reinforcement of prejudice, and societal polarization. But beneath all of that, I strongly suspect the primary cause is our unease at declining prosperity and a growing sense that we inhabit a rudderless society where human values count for little and only company balance sheets seem to matter. We are falling for simplistic, one-dimensional thinking and losing the ability to weigh conflicting evidence and examine multiple sources of information. How else can we account for the current rash of conspiracy theories? How else can we account for the bizarre and alarming popularity of a narcissist science denier and serial liar such as Donald Trump? And how else can we account for the way that his supporters and others try to shout down the global science community who have been warning for decades about global heating, our unwillingness to limit greenhouse gas emissions, and the resulting genocidal trajectory. And this goes on and on. And then uh, what, what he, he 
he's developing the the this thesis of how all of this rising resentment uh, leads to autocracy and uh, of, of course the uh, the ultimate goal uh, fascism it is a short step from this to this if you are not speaking out in 2024 you would not have spoken out in 1934 and then of course in the final paragraph we get to what can we do what can we do to get this from turning into this and everything that means for the planet but we will revisit this article on friday in the ain't gonna happen uh roundup um uh, where uh he you know he 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 pulls out all of this hopium uh bullshit and uh but but admits uh, pretty much it ain't gonna happen and uh if it doesn't happen and it ain't gonna happen uh the bottom line is uh we're fucked uh we 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 knew we were fucked uh before uh we heard one word of that article but it's always good to have another doomer in the echo chamber of the doomosphere here at Collapse Chronicles. Welcome aboard Graham Townsend. I'm sure we will check in with Graham in the future. But right now, uh, my little dog says it is time to check in with some chicken. And I need my factory farmed chicken while I still can. Man, look at this gorgeous, gorgeous planet we live on. Too bad we fucked it up. Bye, guys.